Hi, this is Dr. Jed McCosco at Wake Forest University and Academic Influence, and I have with me today my dear friend, George Cow, who I have not gotten to talk to in probably 20 <laughs> years, but uh, fate has brought us back together today for this little podcast, and I'm excited. Yeah. So I, um, it's good to see you, you and it's, yeah. it's good to be... Uh, to have you uh, and your and your thoughts uh, going over to my audience, and I'm excited for uh, you to put uh, this also on your channel, yes, so totally. people can hear the I, I things wanna, that we talk about. So I want to do a fun. quick intro of you, uh, Doctor Jed, okay. because last time we were together, you weren't Doctor Jed yet, uh, as far as I remember. <laughs> That's right. um, so, uh, and now you've gotten so much um, academic experience, uh, and and beyond that. And I just, so for those who don't know, Jed was uh, one of my college roommates and dear friends. Um, and he had uh, a really profound uh, influence in my life. There was one particular summer that I was, um, I was really struggling with depression. And Jed was just, I feel like Jed kept me alive, really. So um, I've always, uh, I've always been so grateful to you for all your support. And and just beyond that, we, you know, Jed and I worked on some projects together at uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, we were uh, co-teaching a class called like How to Find Your Calling, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, uh, and you know, so so back then we were already uh, we had this kind of joint passion for helping helping young people and uh, anybody who's kind of like looking to to do. To, to have a career they love, how to how to make that make that work. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's kind of yeah. where I wanted to start our half hour conversation. Is just yeah, start right from how a guy like you had many talents, many gifts, many interests as a young person. I think you probably yeah. were nineteen or twenty when we first met. And yeah. It was very clear to me right off the bat that you had. Uh, an interest and a passion and a talent for helping people achieve their true potential, like right yeah. from the beginning. And yeah. it's wonderful to see that 25 years later, you are doing that as your career, as your calling. Yeah. And so yeah. I wanted to sort of <laughs> revisit the steps that happened yeah. between then and now so that yeah. your audience can appreciate a little bit more about your origin story. You, for some people, yeah. I know you're a superhero. You've transformed <laughs> their businesses, helped them become yeah. the solo entrepreneur that they want to be. Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, and this will maybe help them realize that you you had these gifts way back when. So, um, yeah. So yeah. And one other thing that you had back then was you loved technology and loved um, you know, being a bit yeah. of an evangelist for new technologies that can yes. help people. Yes. And I'll never, yes. ever forget or be able to thank you for um, buying me, you know, with with the original crowdsource funding, like you went around the, the dormitory and asked people for money. Uh, you bought me a <laughs> Palm Pilot so that my life would not be in shambles. And that Palm Pilot transformed my my existence because it organized uh, what was very disorganized. So, so you're helping Those people the back then and now. Tell us, tell tell the audience, tell both of our audiences, like yeah. how you how you went from being yeah. a a uh, undergraduate at UC Berkeley. Yes. Uh, how yes. how your major played into your you yeah. know, your learning. Oh yeah, that's and how interesting. That, yeah, just give us a little yeah. background. I know, and I and I hope that those you know the, the the young people listening and the parents listening will will find this uh, inspirational in some way. I, um, you, you know, I, I remember there was a, um, when I went to graduate school uh, later after UC Berkeley, I got a business degree, but graduate degree. And one of my mentors there, the founder of that graduate school, actually, he said something I'll never forget. He said, George, we, uh, we can really only accurately look at our, discover our calling by looking backward. And I was like, that was so profound because we usually try to plan ahead to say, okay, the direction of my life is I'm going to get this degree and then I'm going to work in this field and I'm going to, you know, have this job or whatever. Um, and yeah, it, it may come, it may come to pass that way, or it may go in a different direction or have some kind of combination of other interests and talents that, that you had that creates a role that you couldn't have imagined from the start, um, certainly not for 
for undergrads and even grad students, you know, still, still early days, I'll tell you all, you know, like it's still very much early days. So, so looking back, I mean, that's the question you're asking me. And I, I want to ask you the same question too, like looking back at, at kind of connecting the dots, like you said, I had an early love for evangelizing technology, just showing people, Hey, this is a new device or this is a new website, you know, or tool or whatever. And that's played in very centrally to my career now because I help you know, entrepreneurial people learn technology to, um, you know, to, to activate their calling essentially. And then, um, my degree and one of my favorite courses in high school even, uh, was, you know, my English courses. Right. And then my degree was in uh, UC Berkeley was in English and I've always struggled with writing, but I'm so glad that those classes kind of forced me to work with ideas and to put them on paper and to deliver them on time <laughs> or as close to being on time as possible. And that's what I do uh, as a b big part of my career. Now I write a lot. I've written now five books, self-published five books, and I could not have imagined it because, because I mean, as an, um, as an immigrant, I mean, my family immigrated, immigrated from Taiwan to the, to the United States when I was still learning my first language, let alone now learning a second language. So I've always struggled with communication and writing, but my, my English degrees focused, focused me on, on that. And, um, and then being part of, you know, uh, you know, um, college fellowship, uh, and, you know, having the opportunity to learn how to lead, learn how to work with others has been huge. Of course, now in my career of collaborating with others and leading my students and clients, you know, in a, in a, in a way that helps them collaborate with each other. So, um, mm -hmm. I guess the last thing I'll say is, you know, like the, yeah, it's just back to that quote of, we find our calling by looking backwards. I think it's, I think there's two things there. One is it's really important to continually like journal, uh, maybe, you know, write in the journal or discuss with a friend or, or a mentor. Um, what are some of the highlights and lowlights of your, um, skill building and experimentation with different areas of life. Uh, and what might that, what might some of those hints be for your future career? Um, you know, all of your, your hobbies, interests, passions, quirks, things that come, that are so, uh, come more easily to you than other people and things that energize you more than other people. And also things that, you know, you find uh, harder to get into compared to other people. Um, yeah. you know, and, and, and then the second thing is like, okay, look, look back and notice, but the second thing is to be willing to experiment with as many fields and areas of interest as possible, because you won't ever know, you know, what that combination for you would be if you don't have more ingredients to play with, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, but so, so what about you, Jed? I mean, as you look back well, on your, I mean, yeah. that's, that's the thing is, is looking back I have always enjoyed public speaking, yes. communicating to people in a yeah. verbal way. And yeah. so it is uh, no surprise that I followed my father's footsteps and became a professor, getting to stand up in front and, of a And crowd. family influence is another thing, too, you know, because my, my, my dad big, was an entrepreneur, big, right? Yeah. So you're an entrepreneur too. That's, that's great. I didn't know yeah. your dad. I know your mom a little bit better because she was more yeah. involved in right. your life. Uh, yeah. but I did not know your dad was an entrepreneur. So that's really yeah, cool. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So that's looking back, you know, as a kid, I liked speaking, liked acting, performing. And I saw in my dad's career, the exact sort of pattern of what I wanted. I wanted to travel. I wanted to write, I wanted to speak. And so since I was a little kid, I wanted to be a professor and I really set my <laughs> mind on that and it was all going well until I got to UC Berkeley and, and you were there in my midst of my troubles. I don't know if I shared them with you because of course we were talking about your troubles and I was the older of the two of us. So maybe, maybe you didn't hear all of my troubles, but I had a lot of troubles because getting a PhD is so different from getting an undergraduate degree. Or yeah. I think even, I mean, my wife got an MBA recently and you know, getting an MBA is a lot more like getting an undergraduate degree than it is like working yeah. on a dissertation. That's right. Time after time, day after day, and yeah. trying to do it all on your own and not seeing a lot of people. Uh, so PhD mm. life is difficult, and it really didn't suit me. 
And mm. as soon as I got my PhD, I desperately wanted to get a job as a professor and applied uh -huh. <laughs> to over 40 different job openings. Wow. And uh, wow. I had a huge party to celebrate my PhD. And you maybe remember that I invited you and your friends to be the, the band for that party. <laughs> Um, and you know, I, I, uh, I was so glad you guys uh, agreed to doing it and your music made the, the party fun. Uh, but the placemats at the table where people were sitting and eating, they were original letters from all of the rejections that I got. My mom thought this would be fun, right? right? So, so oh people would be setting their paper plates down on these rejection letters. <laughs> I got as many rejection letters as I had sent out applications. And wow. I, I got, didn't get a single job interview. And that's wow. the way it is. I mean, I, I kind of knew that, but I wanted to see for myself that you cannot get a job as a professor straight out of your PhD program unless wow. you've done something absolutely insanely good. So even yeah. though I had many publications, many citations, I still had to do what they call the postdoc. Right. And that, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that lasted actually five years in my case. Wow. And, and that's pretty typical. So after five yeah. years of post-docking, I finally landed a few job interviews, and one of them produced a job here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Wake Forest University offered me the job, yes. and I said, yes, I'm finally a professor. <laughs> Yay, I've arrived. It's a great university. But it too. wasn't so simple because getting tenure oh, wow. is <laughs> in the same sort of uh, realm as yes. getting a PhD. Oh my God. And as I, as I had trouble with getting a PhD, so also I had trouble getting tenure. I really had to cry out to my higher power, yes. which I know you, uh, yes. encourage people to do. Yes. Um, and, and that came through for me in my third year. Now, so, now th third year as a professor, you got tenure. That, no, in my third no. year, things turned around. Right. I was, um, I was basically nosediving oh, as a professor. Okay. Like I started off, people had high expectations for me. And each year in the first three years, what part I just of it got, did you thrive in doing? I thrived in teaching. I was going to say, but like, as, <laughs> you were as anybody a can tell you, yeah, yeah, I love teaching. Yeah. As anybody can tell you, Teaching is not enough to get tenure mm -hmm. at any of the major universities. Right. And Wake Forest is in the top 30 yeah. ranked national universities right. at U.S. News and World Report year after year. Yeah. Um, so there's no way that they were going to let somebody who couldn't get the research aspect done get tenure. They were going to kick me out after six years. Wow. wow. So, you know, that's where I was really struggling and, and fearful and anxious and crying out. And finally, it all came through when I really released all of that uh, worry and all the what if this happens, then I won't get my dream. Right. right. Released it all to my higher power, which which I know is yeah. something you would probably recommend yeah, people absolutely. who are in that same state of anxiousness. Like, yes. what if my venture doesn't work out? This is what I've been wanting yeah. since I was a little kid. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then once you release it. Uh, yeah. better things can happen. And that's when everything turned around. That's amazing. Now, did, did, how many years uh, total did it take you to get your tenure? And how, how did that, how does that compare to the average you might say, or is there an average? Well, the, the thing is, there is an average. Um, it's always six years okay. and it's the same at Harvard, Wake Forest, okay. and the smallest little university. Yeah. It's always a six year clock mm. and then one wow. extra year for you to find a job if you don't get tenure. So it's a seven year contract. Uh, and that's the typical way it's always been done. And, and seven years is kind of a, a golden number for people at universities. They call it sabbatical when you mm -hmm. go away for a year after right. seven years. Yeah. Um, so there's that sort of biblical Tradition, seven number yeah. uh, woven into yeah, academia. Yeah. Uh, it's changing very quickly. So many universities don't even give out tenure because they want to be like more of a business and if mm. you're not performing you're out of there right uh other universities may have like a two-year clock um and it resets if you're doing well yeah but they can get rid of you before the seven-year clock is out mm -hmm. um and then some universities of course allow you to delay the clock if you are a woman and have a baby right well, now it's very you know very gender non non-discriminatory so, so if you're a man guys and you have can, a baby you can, can also a, yeah 
Yeah, paternity you can take leave. A, you know, a little paternity leave yeah. and extend your clock a little bit. So, yeah. And then during COVID, a lot of universities said, look, we're going to push the clock out. So wow. but six years was the magic number for everywhere. And yeah. I knew I had six years. And in that third year, things were looking grim. So I could see the writing on the wall. I wasn't going to get tenure. I was going to have to leave very soon. And that was just really hard on me. I knew how hard it was to get a job. That in some ways is harder than getting tenure, hmm. except for at the very elite universities. So right. getting a job at Harvard is is easier than getting tenure at Harvard, but wow. getting a job at Wake Forest is harder than getting tenure. At, so the, the yeah. real rate limiting step is finding that first job. And it's easier when you're fresh out of your postdoc to get a job at a good university. Um, it, it, if I hadn't gotten tenure, my only hope would be to get a job at a lesser university. Mm. It was not it was not like I could not get tenure at Wake and then go to one of Wake's similar schools, you know, yeah. uh, you know, co-enrolling schools, schools that are sort of matched with Wake Forest and hope to get a job there. And I certainly couldn't go above it. So I would just have to go well right. below, a few tiers below Wake Forest mm. and hope for a job. So you can see yeah. that, uh, you know, I was nervous. I, I didn't want, I, I had gotten a job at a great university and I did not want to lose that opportunity. And I knew everything was sort of in my own hands or I thought I knew that, but it was only until I let go of what I thought was in my hands that things started coming through. Yeah, and I, I, I think this is a good segue into, maybe we could share with, with each other um, a few of the, I guess, productivity <laughs> Uh, tips yeah. that have really helped us um, because I mean, you've accomplished so much uh, and the academic world is, is can be brutal as, as we know mm -hmm. and um, what I've accomplished is in a I mean because like the academic world is has a very clear track you know or several clear very tracks clear. whereas like what I've been doing uh, there is there's no clear track at all it's like no, you're uh, making it up as you go the, along right George? completely <laughs> completely and 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 it's like I, if if you had asked me if 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 i if i presented my current job quote unquote to my undergraduate self that when, when when we knew each other i would have not known that that was a possible quote unquote job right uh, i mean so much has mm -hmm. changed in society technology but i i want to just uh, you know um uh, so, so I think this is an interesting kind of like dichotomy we have here because on the one hand, like I can yeah. give a few tips about people who are just like, all right, I'm going to create my own career, you know, and I'll yeah. say this, I mean, in, in, in this day and age, as we all know, um, with social media being so important to people's, um, quote unquote, personal brand, uh, you might say, mm -hmm. uh, I, I tell people, listen, there's no, um, you, you almost can't start early enough to learn that kind no. of technology and learn right. how to learn how to, here's the thing, express yourself um, in, in, in your skills and your experiences, your passions, your learnings. Like I, I tell people to start as early as possible because it's like to really, well, to, to thrive in any field, you have to be really good. Obviously you have to be above average yeah. in, um, yeah, it's just ab ab above, above average skillfulness uh, compared to, to others in your field. And to be uh, successful in, well, I, I think certainly in entrepreneurship, but I think in just about any field, um, the ability to communicate yourself um, through verbal or writing uh, is huge. And so it's like social media is a wonderful mm -hmm. opportunity. I, I, I call it like a, sort of like this Venn diagram between learning to express yourself and on the other hand, mm -hmm. uh, learning to make an impact on the world and noticing what mm -hmm. aspects of your expression are more impactful than, than, than other parts. And so I, I tell people like creating content is something that feels so urgent to me, um, on a, on a daily basis, because I know that it's like every day or every week, I, I'm not saying everyone has to create every day, but it's like every week there's an opportunity for me to practice or to not practice, uh, my, 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 you know, learning how to express myself more effectively and to, mm -hmm. uh, observe what the market is responding to or not it's like every every time we create content put it out there there is an op that's an opportunity well like data right like you're you're making an experiment yep. to say hey does this work does that work does that? and of course since you've recorded so many podcast episodes you know hey this episode worked that episode didn't work and, and why is that like what, what what's the pattern there mm -hmm. and so 
uh, I just, you know, whatever social media platform uh, interests the, the, you know, the listener, the watcher, um, start using it to express your learnings. Like, what are you reading? Mm -hmm. What are you watching? What's some peak experience you've had in your life that you that had some kind of lesson there to share with the world? Share those things because yeah. um, that will make you much. Uh, that'll make you just a better communicator over time, and just make your well, a, as you grow your quote unquote personal brand. Um, Sometimes, and I would say oftentimes, your career opportunities can arise from your network or your audience and the people yeah. who have been following you. Even in the beginning, it's just friends and family following you. But it's like they see you grow over the years as you learn to communicate yourself and share your learnings. That's right. They're much more likely to give you career opportunities. <laughs> but, uh, but Jed, yeah. yeah. Well, what about you? What's what's been really useful to you in terms of like, is there a technique or a mindset that helps you to get so much done and and be in touch with so many students and colleagues and and be able to like handle all that? Yeah. Well, I, I like this one uh, talk that I heard. Yeah. It was in reference to the Apostle Paul mm -hmm. getting shipwrecked oh, yeah. in the Mediterranean right. Sea. And the people he was on the boat with, there were hundreds, um, they ended up throwing things into the ocean that at first was like, okay, they're throwing the cargo in. Okay, that's going to be a big financial hit. Oof. But then they started throwing in the actual tackle and the things that you need to sail the wow. boat. They were throwing the ropes in, the pulleys in, everything. So now the boat could not even sail. So, I mean, they, they threw in everything to do what? To save the people's lives that were in the boat. And that was obviously the thing that was most valuable. So they had this, this uh, list of things in their mind that were, you know, more and more and more valuable, starting with the cargo, then what you, you need to sail the boat, and then the people. And, and just the idea of just throwing everything out into the ocean except for the thing that's most important when you're in a crisis yes that helped me a lot mm. i really appreciated that that word of wisdom it, it was just you know like one talk one time yeah. and i listened to that and i thought you know i need to really just throw a lot of things out to focus in on what's most important in my life and so that was after i got tenure Okay. Mm. And I think obviously, you know, it worked out well if I had heard that talk and tried to throw everything out before I got tenure, I would not have gotten tenure because what was most important to me? Was it my job and my career and what I had longed for since I was a kid? No, that was very important. But what's even more important is my family, of course. right? Yes. My wife, my kids. Right. On. So, um, you know, if I had felt that I needed to throw everything in the ocean when I was going through that crisis in year three, I probably would have thrown in all of my work in the lab, all of my research, thrown it away, focused in on my family, and maybe I wouldn't have gotten tenure. Now, I've, I've heard like my podcast co-host, he wrote a book, and in it he talked a lot about his own personal experience getting tenure at Duke University, and he talked about how he was spending 70 80 hours doing mm. research. Wow. And it didn't bother him because he loved it. Yeah. He's like a, he's a geek. You yeah. know, he loved his work yeah. and he enjoyed it. But he was sitting watching a video on a couch and the video was a home video of him, his wife, and his their one child. And as he watched that video, he looked over to his right and saw his daughter over there. And he looked at the video of him laughing and playing with his daughter mm. on the couch. And he looked over there at the daughter. He didn't even know her anymore. Wow. And he decided right then, I am definitely going to drop down the number of hours I spend at work yeah. and spend more time with my family. Yeah. So he balanced it. Yeah. Okay. Whereas in my case, and again, thankfully it was after tenure, I had to just kind of throw things into the ocean. They were gone. Right. You know, they were not wow. balanced. Wow. They were gone. So I think it, it really depends on, you know, sort of like your life phase. circumstances. Yeah. A phase, exactly. So, so, but I, I would definitely recommend one of those two things probably has to happen in most people's lives. They either have to balance things that have gotten out of whack, right. or they have to just throw things into the ocean that, um, that are not 
part of what is absolutely most essential to that. Yeah. And it, it depends, like you said, it depends on the phase. Um, but I've definitely used that latter one in the, in recent years. And I feel like I am being very productive in the sense that I am changing my heart and my life faster than I ever could hmm. have if I just tried to bring things into balance. Right, right. By throwing things into the ocean, I am the most able to change deep down issues and deep down heart things than I could have ever been. It's still painfully slow. I would say it's like glacially slow, mm. <laughs> but it's better than if I hadn't like thrown everything into the ocean. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, really? And uh, yeah, so I'm being very productive. I feel like as, as best I could be uh, with changing my way of handling things. Yes. I mean, at Berkeley, for example, uh, I remember hearing through one of my friends that other people were saying about me, oh, well, that's just Jed, you know, that's just the way he operates. And, you know, when I, I heard, well, what were they talking about? Like being completely out of control, promising things and not following through on them, you know, mm. just, you know, going from one conversation to the next, talking to you, then looking over your shoulder while you're oh, still talking mm -hmm. to me and looking for the next conversation. Yeah. I mean, just stuff like that. Those are the kinds of things that I don't think I could have changed. And I am slowly changing sure. them if I hadn't thrown everything into the ocean. Right. So that whole throwing things into the ocean is an important step if you want to be really productive about one thing yeah. that's most important. Yeah, no, beautiful. Wow. And just like that, our 30 minutes is just about the end. And I really... I know, wanna, right? We could talk for uh, hours. Of course. But I'm glad you're watching the time. Yeah. And I'm glad that uh, that we had this chance to, to hang out. It's been really so fun. So grateful. George. Thank you. Thank you for... I'm Yeah, I'm just glad that we, we've stayed in touch. And uh, that you know, mm -hmm. hasn't been true for most of my college connections. So I, I'm really grateful that yeah. we're, we're back together again. And uh, thank you for thank you for sharing yes. the wisdom and the stories with my people. And uh, I hope whatever I yes. said has been somewhat uh, helpful for, for a few you, people George. out there. So thank you so much, Jed. Okay. Well, it's good to good see to you. See you. Goodbye. Yes, we'll see each other again. Yeah.